They told me to have a seat, so I'll agree with them. I look out here, and I recognize a few of you folks. I have been in this part of Ohio since 1999, and I have been all over the region. I have preached on an awful lot of churches, so um, very few places I go, I don't look out and see somebody that knows me. But, but I am your near neighbor. Uh, I work in a nine-county region, but I actually live right down the road from you in Bristol Lake Subdivision, right down on 125 past Tamilia. So um, I told my wife, she said, where are you going? I said, I don't want to go across the city tonight. I don't go across the county. Uh, I'm right here in the backyard. So I appreciate the invitation to be here. It's an honor. Uh, let me tell you what we're going to do because we want to allow time for questioning. And so we're, we're going to speak briefly to some things that are important. And then we'll go on from there. Um, after I get done, I'm going to introduce a little bit about who Southern Baptists are. And then Pastor Dave Frazier over here is going to talk a little bit about the doctrine. Dave is pastor of First Baptist Church in South Lebanon. Um, and he is also the moderator of our association. He's been there for a couple of uh, terms now. And uh, Dave is well known in our area for doing a whole lot of things. But Dave will be here. And then... Um, I don't know, Dennis Dennis is next. Uh, uh, Dennis has been uh, working with our association for a number of years, and l in recent years, one of his big responsibilities is leading this area in church planning with our North American Mission Board. Um, he can tell a little bit more about that absolutely incredible what is going on in this region and in the past uh, five or six years and planting new churches. I, I have never seen in my life experience so many exciting new churches being planted uh, throughout this region. It's an exciting time. Alan here is um, a deacon at Mount Carmel Baptist Church. Um, how long have you been there? A long time, I think. Long time. <laughs> uh, Alan is... Alan leads our administrative leadership team. We, we involve not just us preacher type, but uh, members of our churches. And Alan is a, a deacon in one of our churches, a re, sort of semi-retired guy. And he'll be sharing more about our association. But, but it's real good to be with you. A little bit about myself. Uh, before coming here to Ohio, I had the uh, privilege of serving as a missionary with their International Mission Board uh, for 14 years in the country of Uruguay in South America. And uh, our family grew up there. Uh, before that, I was a pastor of Southern Baptist churches, mainly over in the St. Louis area in the Midwest. Uh, for about 18 years, I was a pastor, so I've seen uh, different places where Southern Baptists operate. Um, shortly, a history of Southern Baptists, and I was told to do this in five minutes. Or, um, uh, um, in general, uh, back in the 1800s, our nation was divided uh, over the issue of slavery, as you all know. Uh, before that time in history, there were not a lot of Baptist groups. Uh, right down the road in Bethel, Ohio, some of you have been by the old Bethel Church on the right side of the road, uh, that church was a member of the Philadelphia Baptist Association. Uh, that church was established in the late 1700s as folks came down on flat boats down the Ohio River, and, and that was their association. And at that time, Baptists in the United States pretty well worked together in one big family. And one thing that got Baptists all excited uh, was a movement of missions. Uh, various young men uh, became very burdened about lost people in other countries of the world. And they decided, hey, we need to do missionary work. And so we need to start sending missionaries. And so the modern mission movement uh, was started in England as well as here in the United States. Uh, some of you know history, probably know the name of William Carey and Adonair Judson and Luther Rice and a lot of those people in history. Well, that, that, that's what got things going. Well, that was going real good. But then our nation got divided about the time of the Civil War. And we had good folks down south who wanted to send their sons and daughters out as missionaries. And the Baptist group says, you know, we can't do that. Their dads own slaves. And so there was quite a bit of controversy. And so in 1845, the Baptists down south formed what was called, obviously, the Southern Baptist Convention. And the folks on this side of the Ohio River were called the Northern Baptist Convention. And uh, so they sent out missionaries. The first missionary was a woman by the name of Lottie Moon uh, who went to China. 
And then there was a woman also by the name of Annie Armstrong who worked with American Indians. And, and then after that, our second missionaries were sent to Brazil. And then it grew from there uh, to where we have become one of the largest missionary sending groups in the world, where missionaries go to all kinds of places and don't have all the time to uh, talk about all of that. But it has always been the heartbeat that brought these people together was one thing. How do we send missionaries out to tell people about Jesus? And that's how they got organized. And they said, okay, if we're going to do that, we'll have to support them. And so they came up originally with um, various waves of supporting missionaries. But they started taking up missionary offerings and sent, sending out missionaries. And, and as time went on, they decided, well, we need to do a few other things. Uh, we need to educate preachers. So they started forming seminaries. And now there's six of them at different places in the United States. And they decided we need to do some things with publishing, and they start, came up with a publishing house. But all of these things came back to that r original reason we came together, and that was to send missionaries to the far corners of the earth and also here in the United States to let lots and lots of people to know about our blessed Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, along the way, I have discovered something about Baptists. Uh, they don't like to be by themselves. I've told people you could take two Baptist churches and stick them in Siberia, and within a couple of months, those two Baptist preachers will get together, and they're going to start praying together, and they're going to start uh, talking about their churches together, and uh, they'll decide, hey, we're going to have a Christmas sing together or something like that, and have a time of fellowship. And eventually, those things come into being. We call those an association, uh, where people regionally get together. Um, I, I have the privilege, I work with Hispanic church plants in our area, and I met with them a month ago, and about seven or eight of them, and they decided they're going to start meeting once a month, and they decided, hey, we need a family camp, and they decided we're going to get together at Christmas time and get all our churches together and sing together. Well, they're not quite an association yet, but they're acting just like Baptist Act. Uh, we don't like to be by ourselves. Uh, we, we like to know we have other brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Have other questions about history? We can talk about that the rest of the night out in the parking lot. How about that? Uh, Dave, go on. All right. I pastor a, a Southern Baptist church in South Lebanon, Ohio, and people will ask, why are you affiliated with the Southern Baptist Convention there all the time? And I'll, ask, I'll try to answer that. Uh, there's three basic reasons why we want to be affiliated. Uh, one is the mission program. We can be involved in missions all over the world, and um, we can support missionaries who are serving in Uruguay as well as other places in the world. How many missionaries now are just overseas? About 2,000 or so uh, overseas, and then we have uh, a, a similar number here in the North America. So we can support those missionaries through that mission, mission program. So one reason I'm a Southern Baptist is the mission program. We can, we can support all kinds of missionaries the way we do it with a cooperative kind of effort. A second thing that I think of is not only the way we do missions, but the way we govern ourselves. We are not a top-down governing kind of convention. In fact, we hesitate to call ourselves a denomination sometimes. Uh, we call ourselves a convention rather than a denomination, but we don't have people above us like uh, bishops or whatever telling the local church what to do. We believe in a self-governing church. The church is its own autonomous governing body. Um, and so... Uh, what we do is voluntarily affiliate with one another and work together to accomplish uh, projects we couldn't do by ourselves and to have resources that we can share with one another. Third th reason I'm a Southern Baptist is because of our doctrinal statement. So I guess it's my turn to talk about that real fast. Uh, you know, just real quickly, uh, we have a, I have a booklet up here called The Baptist Faith and Message. You can find that online anytime you want to as well. But I'll just say that I, we have copies of it here, real small print, but you can read it, I'm sure. But let me just say we, we believe God the Father is eternal, sovereign, and rules over the whole world. You know, he he's rules over the whole universe. He's all-knowing, all-powerful, all those things that you would expect a Bible-believing Christian to believe. We believe the Lord Jesus Christ is eternal. He is the eternal Son of God, all-knowing, all-wise. I mean, he has all the attributes of God. He became God in the flesh for us so he could die on a cross for our sins and be raised again the third day and is coming back again. Uh, we believe the Holy Spirit, again, is a sovereign God, uh, one God, 
uh, who's come and who's revealed himself in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's all-knowing, all-wise, eternal God. And, uh, but the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father. They're distinct in their personhood, but yet there's one God who's revealed himself in three persons. So we believe that, and we believe the, the Scripture is totally inspired of God. Uh, sometimes I tell our folks it's inspired from table of contents to the concordance, but really you know what I mean, Genesis to Revelation. And we, we believe the original documents are totally inspired of God, they're without error, and we can completely have confidence in them for our faith and our practice as Christians. We believe the Word of God, we believe salvation is by grace through faith. Uh, we can't earn our way to heaven, we can't earn our salvation in any way. God has convicts us of sin and judgment and righteousness and draws us to himself, and we are one of those whosoevers who call on the name of the Lord and we're saved. And as a result of receiving Christ, we have eternal life. It doesn't fade away after two or three years. It's not, uh, it's eternal. Um, it, it lasts forever. That's what a little kid told me one time when I asked him, what's eternal life? He said, well, it lasts forever. Yeah, and that's right. We believe it's eternal. It doesn't fade away. It doesn't go away. It's, it's yours forever, eternity, because of what Christ did on the cross for us. Uh, we, you know, we believe in the church, the local church, the universal church, you would say, is all believers uh, who have trusted Christ since the days of Pentecost till now. Uh, we also believe that God has expressed his, his universal church in a local setting like these churches here. In fact, the majority of the scripture talks about churches in a local sense, and uh, we are, we're grateful to be part of a local church. We believe the Lord Jesus is coming back again. And we believe he's coming back bodily, and uh, he's, he's not sending a representative. He's coming himself, and uh, he's not coming in spirit. He's coming visibly where we can see him, and all, every eye will see. And uh, like the lightning flashing from the east to the west, you know, people will see. There comes Jesus. It's not going to be anything secretive. Uh, so we, those, those are, you know, we believe God has angels, and the devil has pulled away some of those angels and they become demonic creatures and, and those kind of things but uh, that's that's basically where we start and we believe baptism is a sim symbol of our salvation I always tell our people it's kind of like a wedding ring it uh, I, if I this is my third wedding ring but that doesn't mean I've been married three times I've only been married one time but uh, the, it's a symbol of the fact that I've been married baptism is a symbol of our death burial and resurrection of Christ and our belief in that and our, our death to an old life or raised to a new life in Christ and Lord's Supper also symbolic uh, as we remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. So that would be basically our doctrinal statements. But there are other things, you know, like, you know, social things have come up, like what, what it's, what's marriage? And we believe marriage is one man, one woman in a, in a covenant before God. Um, uh, I know there's some other social things out there going on. We don't not, we do, we, we're not supporting uh, same-sex marriage, and um, we don't allow that in any, in any of our seminaries and those kind of things as well. Um, we, uh, we, we, we feel all people need to be saved. Those, those folks need to be saved too. We need to share the gospel with them and, and extend to them the opportunity to be saved. Just like we had to be saved out of some stuff, they got to be saved out of some stuff too, and uh, Christ makes that possible. I think I could stop and pass it on to somebody else. Wow, I thought Dave might summarize the whole Baptist faith and message there. There are several articles, and I would encourage you to pick up one of those uh, booklets. And by the way, um, the Baptist faith and message is not a creedal statement at all. It's a summary of biblical doctrine. The Bible is the ultimate authority, as Dave said, and so we appreciate that. Well, my name is Dennis Holmes, as David said. I'm a North American missionary uh, assigned here in Cincinnati. Um, I've actually been in Cincinnati since 1984, so that predates you, David. Uh, 1984, I was a pastor from 84 to 96 on the west side of Cincinnati, and since 96, I've been serving as a missionary, actually jointly funded by the uh, local association, by the state convention of Baptists in Ohio, and then primarily through the North American Mission Board, which is the way we support missions in the United States and Canada. And so uh, it's been my privilege to serve uh, now as a missionary since 96. And uh, I'm so glad that as a missionary, I've not had to go around to churches looking for support, uh, funding support. That's part of the genius of the cooperative program is that uh, the support that I have for, for my ministry and my family, my income, comes through the cooperative effort of Southern Baptist churches uh, all over the country. And so that's what my assignment is, is to speak briefly about the cooperative program 
That's how we fund missionaries um, and the other uh, boards and agencies, the other entities of the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, the cooperative program has been around since 1925, and we do believe it's the genius of the way we, uh, of the mission enterprise uh, of Southern Baptist. Um, as a matter of fact, um, Southern Baptist um, here in North America and internationally, Southern Baptists baptize a person every 35 seconds. That's an amazing statistic to me that someplace in the world, someone is being baptized every 35 seconds that's going to be part of a Southern Baptist church. And so we praise the Lord for that. That includes our international missions effort as well. Uh, the cooperative program, though, is, as a matter of fact, my mentor pastor years ago used to say, well, I believe in the cooperative program because as a pastor, you know, I got tired of uh, independent missionaries coming around asking for funding, and I could just say, well, I gave it the office. And so that's it. That is kind of what we do. We, we, uh, we uh, voluntarily cooperate as Southern Baptist churches in giving to missions. It doesn't mean that we can't support our own independent local missionary. We can do that. We can support a missionary across the world. That's, that's, the, 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 um, that's the decision of the local church. Every Southern Baptist church is an autonomous church or an independent church, but we voluntarily cooperate in the area of missions uh, by giving, and, and these aren't dues, uh, these are mission gifts that we give through the state convention of Baptist in Ohio. We have an office in Columbus, and then uh, some of the uh, some of our mission gifts stays stay in Ohio, and then some goes on to support other uh, missions uh, mission endeavors of the Southern Baptist Convention. So, in terms of giving. Um, there's the, it's, it's all based on Acts 1-8, uh, you know, we're to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other most ends of the earth. So the way we're, they're, they're, we're witnessing in Jerusalem is to be part of a local association. David is leading our local association of Baptists. It's called the Cincinnati Area Baptist Association. That would be your decision to affiliate with us through the association. When you do that, you become automatically a member of the State Convention of Baptists in Ohio and of the... Um, of the National Southern Baptist Convention. But um, the cooperative program then, so we give locally to the association, but then we also give through the State Convention of Baptists in Ohio, about 60% of what we give uh, through the State Convention stays in the state to support various ministries of evangelism and missions and uh, Bible study and leadership in the state. And then 40% goes to unite with other funds from other Southern Baptist churches to support uh, International missions, 50% of what leaves Ohio ends up on the international missions field and uh, supporting uh, 2,000 missionaries in, di in different countries of the world. And then about 22, 23% stays in North America. Uh, that's how I'm supported. And the North American Mission Board is primarily interested in church planting, uh, not solely in church planting, but that's the primary thrust of the North American Mission Board through an effort we call, we call Send North America. We have 32 cities in uh, the United States and Canada, five in Canada, so 27 in the United States, three in Ohio actually, Cincinnati, Columbus, and Cleveland, where we're focusing, because that's where the population is centered, we're focusing on reaching people in the cities through church planting. So I, it's my privilege right now to be working with about 35 different church planters across the city. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's what, that, that, that's the, the money that leaves Ohio goes to the International Mission Board, to the North American Mission Board. It goes to support our six seminaries. David mentioned we uh, needed to train um, pastors and missionaries. And so we have seminaries. The closest one is in Louisville, a Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. We have one in North Carolina, one in uh, Missouri, one in California, one in Texas, and one in New Orleans, New Orleans. So those are the six seminaries. Uh, not all of our pastors come out of those seminaries. Some of our pastors aren't seminary trained. Some come from other independent seminaries. So, it, again, it's all about the local church and the autonomy of the local church. So the, no one assigns a pastor. Uh, and by the way, the Southern Baptist Convention doesn't ordain pastors. That's a local church observance or ordinance. And so uh, you would ordain your own. The church ordains a pastor. So the Southern Baptist Convention has no authority over any local church. The Southern Baptist Convention doesn't have any authority over our local association or our state convention. All are autonomous groups. When we meet, like uh, Brent and the staff in Columbus for the national meeting, a two-day meeting, we send 
uh, messengers they're called. They're not delegates representing their churches. They're just there uh, uh, gathering together as messengers to vote their own consciences on, on business and budget and the things we do at a Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, other ways that cooperative programs used is for the uh, Ethics and Religious Liberties Commission. You may have heard of a guy named Russell Moore. He's leading the charge for religious freedom, not only among Southern Baptists, but among evangelicals um, through his work um, in Washington, D.C. We have what's now the Lifeway, Lifeway Christian Resources that uh, we, uh, the, some of the cooperative program money goes to Lifeway. It used to be called the Sunday School Board of the Southern Baptist Convention, but but there again, those resources, curriculums that are used for small group study, uh, publishing Bibles, all sorts of uh, uh, publishing materials, but not any church has to use any of those. You can use something from Lifeway. You don't have to use anything from Lifeway, but there's a lot of options that are available through Lifeway uh, for Christian education and discipleship. Um, so seminaries, Lifeway, there's Guidestone, which is a, a, a way that uh, we're providing uh, for retirement and health insurance for Southern Baptist pastors. Some of the cooperative program money goes for that. It's all about economy and effectiveness and efficiency uh, that we as cooperating Baptists feel like we can do more with our mission dollars and uniting like that. Um, that's a cooperative program, so it would go start in Columbus and then go to the uttermost uh, regions of the world voluntarily uh, some churches give a set amount a month some maybe have a budget for a year uh, there's um, uh, some give percentage of undesignated offerings again that's all left up to the local church in addition to the cooperative program we have two major offerings David mentioned Lottie Moon and Annie Armstrong when when we give to a special Lottie Moon offering 100% of that goes to international missions when we give to a special Annie Armstrong offering 100% of that goes to support North American missions. So in addition to, um, um, you know, the cooperative program, we have those offerings to support missionaries. Um, no, you know, North American Mission Board, I said primarily is about church planting, but we also do disaster relief. We have our own local mud out union, uh, unit that uh, Alan might speak to, but disaster relief, Southern Baptist disaster relief is second only to the American Red Cross in, in the way we help people uh, through disasters and so we have opportunities to participate in disaster relief um, other efforts but uh, I could go on I guess my time's up I'm sure it is but that's the cooperative program but hear me when I say that's about effectiveness efficiency uh, it's not dues it's a matter it's mission giving but uniting together so that we might do more for the cause of Christ does it feel like you're drinking out of a fire hose yeah <laughs> let me let me speak a little bit at a local level. First, uh, uh, my name's Alan Suit. I'm, a, I'm retired from P&G. Uh, my church home is Mount Carmel, the one in Kenwood, just north of the Kenwood Mall. Uh, when I listen to these guys talk about missions being at the heart of what we do, it certainly plays out in, in my own church. My, uh, my own church goes back to 1823. Uh, it's one of the earliest Baptist churches on that side of town. Uh, and it was interesting when we go into our, in our own history of one church, uh, back in the 1800s, not at the same time as the Southern Baptist thing was, was created, was our church wrestled with, do we get involved in missions outside the local church? And it was interesting because the church split right down the middle. Some felt we should not do that. You should just take care of your own. The other half said, no, we got to be involved in Acts 1-8 type ministry and so they split and what our church where it is now is from the group that split that said we're going to do missions the other group disappeared after about five years uh, again because they weren't at the heart of God uh, for the let me talk a little bit about the local association because when we get invited when, as Dennis said when you join and choose to affiliate as a local church you're really joining the local association. Uh, our association is, as Dennis said, is called Cincinnati Area Baptist Association. A couple years ago, we actually had two associations covering a nine county area. Uh, one was called Southern Hills. David was leading that one. The other was uh, uh, Baptist Association of Greater Cincinnati, which was mainly inside the 275 loop over to Indiana. 
and Dennis led that one. So uh, we felt uh, out of the same sense of coming together, efficiency, best use of resources, we actually combined our two associations and now we have over 100 churches. Uh, very active in church planning, starting new, new churches, uh, and, and we've also had a number of independent churches choose to affiliate with us in the last couple of years. Uh, so you won't be the first by, by any stretch in considering this, this kind of path. Uh, the structure of the association basically is we have two business meetings a year. Uh, and in that, we'll vote on things like budget. Uh, we're, we'll share what's going on around our local mission efforts and whatever else is uh, appropriate. The other, uh, one other business part is we will then welcome, and because the association, just like you will vote as a church, do you want to affiliate? The association also will vote, do we want to affiliate or associate uh, with, and respond to your request? Uh, that's done in one of these two business meetings. In the interim, we have a, a leadership structure called the administrative leadership team of which I'm a chair of this year. And our job is to deal with personnel, it's to deal with budgets and, and finance, and to do the credentialing that, uh, that we call it credentialing of, of checking out churches that want to be part of the association. Okay? So in our work, we've got a number of ministry team leaders, youth, women's and others that are operating across the association as a volunteer leadership, they will make budget requests of, you know, we need this, and it's our job uh, there to, to try to disperse the resources consistent with the ministry direction of the association. Some of the ministry stuff we do locally, you've already heard about the uh, block party trailers from Brent. That is a wonderful resource. Our church uses it every year. Uh, and it, it basically is a trailer that's set up with inflatable games, popcorn machines, stuff that you don't have to go out and rent. It's a very nominal fee. We basically just cover the basic expenses. We have another missionary called, uh, named Oliver Hawkins who is part of his role is keeping that squared away. We also have a shower trailer that we built ourselves when we have a lot of mission teams come to Cincinnati, uh, like during the summer, and you'll have you know hundreds of kids and stuff coming in to do mission work in Cincinnati, uh, they need a they need a shower at least every two or three days, right? <laughs> you know if you, if you've ever been on one of these kind of mission trips, and so we actually built one that we can hook up and actually support that. It, that could also get used in disaster relief. We've got a disaster relief group that's been all over the country helping families who have been flooded out. And they've been trained and they do wonderful work uh, on, on that. In fact, they just came back from, was it Wyoming? Wyoming. Wyoming. They went all the way out there because they had some serious flooding that uh, this team responded to. Uh, we have a couple focus. Uh, in the fall, we have a race for hunger to support our hunger relief efforts in the Cincinnati area. And uh, there's events if, uh, like that like laid out through the year that you can choose to participate. So uh, a lot of that, again, is driven and led by our associational missionaries. Our associational office is over on Clough Pike near Eastgate Mall, uh, about a mile from there. And that's where we keep all our trailers for people to take out, and it's where the office is uh, for, and there's meeting space there if anybody needs it. Uh, when we talk about affiliation, let me talk it from our end. You as an independent church, if you want to consider for whatever the reasons are that you, you, you think it's in your best interest in the, in the vision and, and, and mission effort for your church to affiliate with us, we basically ask two, just two or three things. That you can, as a doctrinal statement from your church, affirm the Baptist faith and message. Now, every church, you, you may already have a doctrinal statement that touches in different words, but the core, we want you to be able to say, we have no issue with Baptist faith and message, because that's the doctrinal piece that kind of binds us together at the core, what the scripture says about Jesus and the Lord. Uh, the second thing is we do, we would expect that you'd step into the mission focus around cooperative program and 
that you would contribute. And as Dennis said, there's no, you know, a minimum dues or whatever. It's whatever your budget situation is. You all work through that, especially as a growing church, is you would be able to contribute financially to the association at some level, okay? The third piece that, that you get, we'd, we'd want you to participate in all these joint mission efforts to the extent that you can and that it's, it's consistent with, with, with where you're going as a church. When we have the two business meetings, if you're part of the association, you get to have three people, three messengers, if you will, vote from your church. So it doesn't matter whether you're a small church or a big church. When we come together in business, we're operating with a level. We all have three votes uh, because we're trying to uh, support voluntarily working together against the things that are important. Uh, well, I'll stop there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I left, I left out one other. We also, as part of our association, have a very strong work at UC and also at UC Claremont. Uh, Ken Dillard is a full-time collegiate minister. Uh, he's been doing that for o over 20, 25, uh, and it does excellent work down on UC campus in Clifton. We actually have a Baptist house that uh, we have uh, students can live there, uh, as well as a lot of ministry stuff. And if any of you are in college or know what the college scene is these days, having a visible presence on campus. D uh, Ken himself has actually been invited by professors to come in and teach. And if you think about that in a public university, that doesn't happen very much anymore. Uh, so he, he's, he's very connected with the school, and a, that, that's another great part of, of what we do as an association. Okay, Brent, you want to yeah, coordinate um, questions? Or? Absolutely, want to uh, open it up for any questions. I'm going I'm to start with my, my, my question. You guys be brewing, thinking about what you want to ask. But once a missionary um, or someone goes to your seminary, graduates, um, goes to the approval process, how long does it take them to get to their field? Been down that road. Um, it depends on where they're beginning their journey at. Um, there are various levels which a missionary, you know, we, not all of our missionaries are seminary grads. Some of them have other kind of training. Um, they, they, they apply, they send in inf information. They have to have the approval of first their own local church, their own pastor, their right. own churches have to say, we're, we're behind them. Mm -hmm. And then after that, they go through, they have a lot of references and so forth. A lot of it depends on how quickly they go through the paperwork. Okay. Um, like and like in my case, my wife and I probably went through it in a matter of months, but we 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 were in a very good situation. My, I'd already had all my education and everything, so it goes a little bit on that. Some couples um, get started in their education, and it takes them a while to finish up. They have the calling early on. We have a young man that grew up in Williamsburg, uh, who is currently, and I can't even tell you where he's at right now. Is an unreached people group. Uh, but he went graduated from Williamsburg High School, but um, he, he went into UC, but he, he expressed his call. And everybody knew he had a call along with his wife and eventually went to the seminary. And so it took them a long time, but it wasn't because the process was lengthy. It was just they were going through different steps. So let's say they, they graduated college, they are approved, then they can go right to the field? If the openings are there, that's okay. correct. They have to, you know, the first thing they want to know is uh, where, where under God are you called? Okay. And then it depends upon, you know, what currently. And also anymore, if you were at Southern Baptist Convention, there is now going to be a huge emphasis not only deploying the full-time missionaries that will be on the field, but thousands and thousands of folks are being challenged to come out of our local churches to go for long-term volunteer, short-term. Mm -hmm. Maybe the local church will support certain people out of their churches. Right. Uh, we're looking at sending literally thousands and thousands of more people okay. uh, in, into this overseas mission endeavor. And the reason I bring that up, guys, is uh, cur uh, cur uh, cur uh, currently, currently, at least with, with the setup we have, when someone finishes college and they get approved, it takes them anywhere from two to four years before they ever step foot in the country because they're having to raise support. So if you're trying to understand what the cooperative program is about, you finish your schooling, you get approved, and really you're just going through the paperwork with whatever government you're going towards in order to get on the field much, much faster. And th as far as the local missionary, the, the, one of the, the emphasis, emphasis is at the, uh, the national meeting was um, God using just regular folk like us. 
could we go to a country and live for a year and and help a missionary out? Um, so those are some things um, that, that could be options uh, for us being a part of the SBC. I mean, God might have you in a foreign country for six months and bring you back and you're here for the rest of your life. But uh, those options are available uh, to us, as, as well as, like they said, the disaster relief. When they're talking about disaster relief, they're talking about mobilizing us to go and help people in an organized fashion. Um, so let's open up for some other questions. So don't be shy. You guys usually aren't too shy. So what do you got? Just lay it out there. I've already asked a couple questions, so throw your hand up. I know you guys got some. You've been asking me. Yeah, Mike, hold on. Let me bring the mic over to you because we're recording this for those who couldn't be here tonight. Go ahead, Mike. The uh, LifeWay program and the, the educational materials, is that all uh, King James material from King James Bible, or do they use other? There is a King James option because we have some churches that honor you know, this is what they would prefer, and so those churches who prefer a King James translation, that is available, but obviously we have other churches who that is not something that, you know, they, they, they're, they got folks who like King James, some who don't, that doesn't matter, but, you know, we recognize across this nation, many churches still prefer the King James, so uh, that's how that works. Okay. Keep them coming. Yeah, Tony, let me get back to you. For the churches that you go to and they say, no, we don't want to be affiliated with you guys, what's their number one reason, and how do you answer that? Actually, to, uh, to be honest, we really haven't uh, had this kind of so, uh, scenario uh, show up yet. Usually the, the church, you, uh, either through the pastor or the staff or somebody who has had a Southern Baptist background gets the conversation started inside the church, and they do what Brent did, They'll call up and want to talk to one of us uh, about what does it mean to be Southern Baptist so that they can get a picture in their mind of is there a benefit or not. Usually if they don't see the benefit or, th or there's some doctrinal thing that is uh, crossways, then the process kind of ends at that point. Right? Uh, very, I mean, we, at least when I've been on uh, uh, ALT for a while, uh, we've had a number of churches join, and this credentialing, the key part, the reason we want to have a, a discussion with you and have you actually consider all the pros and cons yeah, is that we want you coming in with eyes wide open who this SPC is and isn't, yeah, and, and the same for us. Because we, we push and emphasize we voluntarily are choosing to associate with each other for a bigger cause, so we can accomplish more than we can do on our own. The core, just like the Bible says, the core of that is, can we be unified against a vision of missions, okay? And there's a lot of variation as to worship style, size of church. Uh, our association right now, half of our churches have bivocational pastors, uh, you know, are not big enough budget-wise to support full-time uh, even one, okay? But we've also got other churches with multiple staff. The point is we choose together to work together. So if there would be anything about your practices that would cause division with other churches in the association, we'd want to know about it. So like, for example, if you, you read Baptist Faith and Message and you don't buy something in that, then we ought to know about it too because what we don't want is disunity that causes us either side to get off track. Does that help? By the way, we're, we're not here recruiting you all. We're here at Brent, at Pastor Brent's invitation. We're not, we're not going around and, and asking churches to join us. We're waiting for churches that might know something about Southern Baptists, have an interest. And then uh, there have been times in meeting and looking over doctrinal statements of the church that we saw that they really are practicing things that we, we wouldn't agree with that would cause disunity. And so... We've said no to churches maybe that have wanted to join us, but I can't think of any churches that want to, that uh, I haven't seen it work the other way, actually. Uh, but we're not here recruiting you all, believe me. We're, we just wanted to share something about SBC. 
Excellent. Yeah, Sylvia. In, in the world today, there's such a division and in our faith and in in the standards the government is placing on us. Does the SBC have a presence in D.C. to let our Christian voice be heard in, in some of these decisions that the government's making? Yes, when I talked about uh, Russell Moore is the leader of the uh, re uh, Ethics and Religious Liberties Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, supported through our cooperative program, he spends a lot of time in Washington, D.C. As a matter of fact, I was speaking in a church the week after the recent Supreme Court decision on same-sex marriage. He had written a wonderful editorial that was in the, the Washington Post that I read verbatim uh, during that Sunday morning service that was a help to a lot of the people in the church. As a matter of fact, he has led, uh, among other evangelicals, in preparing a document that will help churches in the years to come to be uh, positioned so that uh, they're ready for lawsuits that might come against them. And so there is much help these days, not only in religious liberty, but in terms of the cultural wars that we're about in the U.S. All right. Yeah, one more. Okay. And, and I, uh, you know, uh, I would invite anybody to Google Russell Moore's name, and you could pull up a lot of articles, and you could see something from his voice. He's, he's become a very a clear statesman for Southern Baptist in terms of um, religious liberty and the culture in the U.S. and, and unapolog unapologetically as well. And um, what I appreciated about that article in the Washington Post is that we have no reason to fear or to, no reason to sh shy away. We have the good news of Jesus Christ, and as time goes on, people are going to be drawn to the gospel of Jesus. My next question was about disaster relief. Um, used to do it with Civil Air Patrol with the U.S. Air Force, but um, are you teaching assessment, um, you know, disaster assessment, and I guess for your deploy your mobilization out to Wyoming, is there things for like daily things, like for those of us who cannot travel for kitchen help for assisting the Red Cross in, in the first phases of the disaster? Okay, I can speak a little bit about that. I, we, we have uh, our, our disaster team cannot go anywhere unless they have been requested by local authorities and the only ones who can go who have been trained by what we do here in Ohio our teams are all trained to do disaster relief it's not huge training uh, mud outs real real simple you have a strong backbone it's mainly uh, safety type issues but uh, we, we our teams are trained and we offer local training uh, no one can go out on our team until they're trained in fact no one can even go into a disaster area unless they are trained. Uh, if you ever watch TV and see disaster relief going on in different storms and places, uh, our disaster teams are the guys running around with the yellow shirts. Uh, they're quite famous for what they do. So let's say if Sylvia wanted to be a part of that team, what would be the process for, the, for someone to be a yeah, part of that? All they gotta do is call and say they, they're interested and they will be told about the next available training. We are looking for folks all the time, and our team is made up of men and women. Um, because of what we do, they have to be at least 18 years of age. But uh, most of our team, it tends to be folks who are in retirement. Uh, but anybody from 18 on up, as long as you can um, help out, and uh, they do a whole lot of work. Uh, they, I think they've been to six or seven states in recent time. They're in a very active group, so what they're doing. That's our local group. Yeah, that's our local group. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, to, and to that point, if you... Uh, Pull up Southern Baptist Disaster Relief. Uh, they, they put out a newsletter every week about all the places in the country and the world that teams have volunteered to go. Like it, uh, up at, uh, is it Sandy in New York, the hurricane that wiped that. We still have people going up there volunteering to help because there's still huge need. So uh, there are lots of places around the country to check in on. Keep it going, Mike. My question is uh, twofold. Um, is there anything that the convention does to make sure that churches uh, stay in line with the statement of faith? And then if a church is found to have fallen out of line, what, what then is the, the policy? Our association does have a constitution 
and a set of bylaws. And in our bylaws that we just recently voted since we brought two different associations together, uh, we speak to the fact that if a church gets off track and after following the biblical uh, approach of going to them, showing them that what you're doing is not biblical and they refused to uh, change, we, we have a process built in place in the association that the association can basically kick the church out. Yeah, it hasn't happened yet that because uh, most of the churches understand what, what this is and when we go and talk, if there's any, any kind of drift uh, around the core biblical stuff, yeah, it, again, it hasn't happened yet. And, and that, that would also hold true for our state convention of Baptists in Ohio and the national convention. Um, just when we met in Columbus, there was the seating of the messengers and so any, if there's any question about a church um, being appropriately seated in the message, that's when that comes up. And so there is a, uh, uh, a matter of church discipline, yes. Probably one of the burning issues is the one about marriage and what we believe about that. And we have had churches um, not in our association, gratefully. They, I think they all would believe word for word what you all would probably believe, but nationally, there have been several churches who have been asked to leave the Southern Baptist Convention because of their stand about marriage, which was in disagreement with what we believe. So there is, there is a possibility that a church could be asked to leave if they disagree with some of these core values that we hold dear. Excellent. Let's keep it going. Get a couple more questions out of here. One question, two questions. Sylvia, Sylvia you're a machine tonight. You're okay. You're okay. Change. Does dress code change? I'm just going to ask it. I'll, I'll answer that one. No, but you guys can go ahead and answer it. Okay. What was it? She wanted to know about dress code. <laughs> yeah, the, the men have to wear three-piece suits. and uh, We're not yeah. joining the Southern Baptist yeah. Convention yeah. if that's the case. <laughs> Jeans are banned and all that stuff, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Those are local church issues yeah. once again. Yeah, let, let me ask that one. We, again, we go back to the autonomy of the local church. If a local church, if your pastor next week wants everybody to come in sombreros and uh, boots or whatever, if that's what you all want to do, I'm not going to disagree with your pastor. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be the only one here. But <laughs> <laughs> All right, any other questions tonight? we got time for one or two more. Tanya, all right. We'll take one more question after Tanya, and then we'll, we'll close. That's a mouthful, man. <laughs> <laughs> this is just to clarify as far as finances, and budgeting, do you guys dictate what our church does or does not do with our money? Is that still up to our church to set our own budget? Okay, your church um, is totally autonomous, independent, operating like you always have. Uh, the local congregation determines under whatever way you do it uh, what you will participate and what level. There are no dues, there is no assignment. Um, our financial secretary will not send you a, a, a nasty letter one month that you don't send us anything. Um, we, ha we have churches that really don't give a whole lot, and we hope they will give more someday. We have some churches that are absolutely astonishing what they give, but that's totally up to that local congregation. We do not at all have it, never done that, never will do that, um, tell the church what they give or don't give. All right, one, one more question, Sharon. Is there ever a time when a pastor is asked to go to another church? Why are you saying that? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel really good right now. <laughs> I, I think that's another local church uh, autonomous, but I'll let them answer that. Go ahead, yeah, guys. Yeah, that, that was the word we're going to use. It's local. You, you decide who your pastor is. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> what? <laughs> Ouch. All right, I think, oh, we got one more, okay. If this is one of your cheesy jokes, no, I'm kidding. Are, are we required to support the Steelers? Oh, well, I, I knew you had to get one in. Yes, you are, and none of you have listened to me for two and a half years concerning that. All right, well, do you guys have anything with that one? I didn't think so. I, I won't touch that one. Okay, well, let's give these guys a hand real quick, Bridgeway. Thank you guys for being with us tonight.
Why don't we go ahead? We'll have a word of prayer. If you have some other questions you'd like to ask them, I'm sure they'll be here for a few more minutes. Okay, uh, let's. Pastor, one yeah. thing I do have copies of. Um, this was our last. We meet twice a year, but in this, uh, in this report, is a copy of our Constitution and bylaws. Okay. Uh, you will appreciate our Constitution as a whole one page. Hey, I like the sound of that. Uh, short, sweet, and to the point. Excellent. Well, let's let's pray together. Father, we love you, and. Um, just, just guide us, Lord, as we, we think about taking this step. Um, I, I see a lot of benefit, Lord. I see a great opportunity for us to have the, the gospel spread even further um, by affiliating uh, with, with this convention. Um, I, I just pray for our church that, uh, again, we would prayerfully consider this and uh, that it would be a, a church decision and that we would seek your will concerning it. We thank you for the men being here tonight, sharing their hearts, sharing all the information that they have. And uh, we just pray, Father, you dismiss us with your blessing in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Thanks for coming tonight. We'll see you later.